Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with custom knife maker and Knife Perspective Podcast co-host, Dan Eastland. I had the good fortune of meeting Dan at Blade Show 2022, where he was representing his dogwood custom kitchen and outdoors knives. Last week, Dan sent me a box of three of his personal custom kitchen knives to check out. And man alive, is there a difference between a high-end production kitchen knife, which is of course what I have, and a custom dogwood chef's knife, which is what I need to have. From the sumptuously contoured handles made of exotic materials to the unique yet utilitarian blade profiles and grinds, I use cooking knives all the time, but having these dogwood custom knives hanging around this past week makes me feel like I have to up my game in the kitchen. And by the way, that's in more ways than one. We'll talk all about it with Dan, but first be sure to like, comment, subscribe, hit the notification bell, and download the show to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen when you're on the go. And as always, please join us on Patreon if you're interested in supporting the show. Uh, if you like exclusive content, interview extras, knife giveaways, and more, you might want to check it out. Quickest way to get there is to go over to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that address is thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. The Get Upside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. Get Upside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit thenifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash save on gas. Hey, Dan, welcome to the show. How are you? Thank you very much for having me on. Oh, it's my pleasure. It was uh, it was really cool to meet you at Blade Show. Clay Alder of uh, Knife Magazine brought me by. He's, you have to meet him, and uh, it was cool. You were there in your in your kilt, and uh, and you had some man some just beautiful knives about. And uh, then once we were talking, you also brought up your podcast. I was like, oh yeah. So anyway, it's a pleasure to have you. And I got to say thank you uh, for your trust and generosity in sending these three beautiful kitchen knives my way uh, to check out. They have been a revelation of sorts. Thank you. Yeah, no, when I when I heard you like to play in the kitchen, uh, I, you know, I, I vel- let me try that again. I'm not used to being on this side of the microphone. It may take <laughs> yeah. me a minute to relax. Yeah. Um, no, when I heard that you like to play in the kitchen as well, uh, I was really excited at the opportunity to let you use them for a little while and get some feedback. I, uh, I'm always trying to get, trying to refine things from, uh, from knowledgeable users. Everybody that I've worked with, I learned something from. So it was a, a great opportunity for me as well. Oh, and I'm just a nice guy. So, I mean, I- Oh, well, Hey, <laughs> yeah, I think getting that feedback from knowledgeable users is, is a good thing. And, the great thing about kitchen knives is pretty much everyone you know is a knowledgeable user. That doesn't necessarily mean they got the technique from a kitchen or from a from working in a kitchen or from a cooking academy or something like that. But everyone uses kitchen knives and and probably uses them every day. So it's it's cool to be able to get your knives in the hands of people. How did you get started uh, with kitchen knives? Um. So. Uh, before we had kids, my wife and I lived in Atlanta and we had gotten really accustomed to going out to eat a lot. Several of my buddies were coming up. They were line cooks, sous chefs. They were coming up through the ranks in the the Atlanta restaurant industry. Um, My first son was born premature and needed constant care. Uh, I was back in college. Uh, My wife was working and the easiest thing for us to do was for me to drop out of school and take care of him. And we had gotten used to eating really well, um, but now with a kid, we were not going out anymore. Mm -hmm. So I got down a copy of The Joy of Cooking and started at page one and just started working my way through. And that got to be kind of my activity with, with Jack is we'd go to the farmer's market, we'd find produce, whatever was available. I'd come home, plan the menu. So when I started... Uh, my apprenticeship and got into knife making, 
I realized how incredibly underserved the kitchen industry was. You know, steels that the outdoor industry had been using for 10 or 15 years still weren't being used in the kitchen industry. You know, your options for handles were black plastic, white plastic, or pay $1,500 for a custom. You know, there was no, there was no up-to-date quality products available for home cooks, line cooks, really anyone that, and most of us can't afford a $1,500 kitchen knife. So right. it kind of got to be my passion to, to fill that market. You know, my gosh, I haven't thought about that until this moment, but uh, because you just put it in my head, but the idea that, uh, yeah, you're right. I mean, I have, uh, like I mentioned before, I have a couple of Wustoffs and I have, uh, you know, some Shuns and some higher end production knives, you know, that we got for our wedding, this and that, um, black plastic handle. And you're right. If you want, if you want to change it up, you can get white, I believe, <laughs> but but there's nothing like the variety you see in the pocket knife industry, for instance. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, uh, my prize possession was a set of uh, Hinkle S that we'd gotten for our uh, wedding. And it's an eighth of an inch of unknown stainless steel <laughs> that constantly had to be tuned up. And that was a really high end kitchen knife. Uh, and that's that frustrated me. Yeah, that's funny. An eighth of an inch. You're right. I, that that was one of the things that immediately struck me about your knives. And you couldn't even see that I was holding up because it's so damn thin. But how thin these are. I mean, you're starting off with thin stock. And two of them, this knife and this knife in particular, I noticed uh, uh, Dan sent me a picture of these knives on his wall and said, you know, pick one uh, to, to use. And I I, I guess I picked three or <laughs> he was generous <laughs> enough to send three. Uh, but it's this right here that struck that, that caught my eye. I was like that, that bevel only goes up so high. And I was wondering, I asked you, is it a chisel grind? And you said, no, it's like that on both sides. Explain uh, as you explain to me why you do that. Uh, you, you mean the height of the grind? Yeah. <clears throat> so if you're four times thinner at the spine, to have the same cutting angle, your bevel is going to be four times lower. Um, so because of that stock starts out at one sixteenth of an inch and sometimes I thin it out from there, what can look like a Scandi grind is actually a, a six degree or in some cases a three degree grind. But because the spine is so thin, the grind just doesn't go that far up. Right. That That's exactly what. So yeah. when I got it, I, I realized I was like. I, I was looking at it and I turn it. Oh, it's because it's so incredibly thin. It amazes. I mean, it really amazes me um, mm. how you can get a knife this thin on a machine uh, with fast spinning abrasives um, and not go through the other side. It is so thin. Um, okay, let's back up here. How do you just explain how you got into the kitchen knife uh, arena and why? But tell me about how you got into knives in general. What's your background? I mean, it seemed to be quite varied. Um, it is. Um, you know, my first uh, my first knife was a little two blade Barlow pocket knife, brown handle. I think my dad gave it to me when I was six, um, and I clutched that thing all through the woods of North Georgia, hunting and fishing with my dad. So my first experience with knives was hunting. Um, I worked landscaping for a while. I was in the infantry for a while. I like to cook. So I, I used a broad spectrum of edge tools in lots of different ways. And then when I was in school, I was studying engineering. So when I got into knife making, I actually didn't have a lot of industry background. I mean, I was carrying old bucks. Um, I had a Gerber mini mag that was my go-to knife for dressing game. But I wasn't, I wasn't a collector. I wasn't deep into the industry. Um, but I, I came from an engineering background. So when I started making knives, I approached the blade as a double inclined plane. And the Greeks proved a long time ago, the lower the angle, the more efficient it is. So I, I just came at it from a little different direction. Okay. I'm, I'm going to have to ask you. So you're saying that the... Uh, in in what the Greeks discovered or proved uh, that the lower the angle of the incline, 
the more efficient it is, say, for whether you're wheeling something up it as a ramp or whether you're trying to cleave yeah. through a material. Pushing a wedge through a material is the same mechanism as pushing a heavy box up. Um, you know, in one case, you're dealing with one facet instead of two, but for all practical purposes, it's it's the same formula. Um, and one of the one of the things I'll ask my clients sometimes when they're not sure about some of the angle stuff is, you know, if you have a really heavy box, do you want to push it up a short steep ramp or a long low ramp? And really, the what limits that is the structural ability of the steel. As long as the steel can hold integrity and stand up to the use, the lowest possible angle is what you need to go for. And it's one of the reasons I very early jumped on and fully drank the Kool-Aid on some of the particle steels, mm -hmm. uh, because they they let me work with really thin blades. They were they were so tough, uh, and that grain structure locked together really well and gave you great edge retention. But for me, what I really loved is the toughness, and that let me really start pushing the limits on on thin high grinds. Um, in fact, some of the ones you've got now are early blades. I've I've doubled the height of the grind on some of the uh, 1 16th now. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So this this is 1 16th, and this one looks a little bit thicker. And this one, just but ever so slightly thicker. This one is a fully flat ground. And yeah, this so one the has one in, the one on your right is is 3 30 seconds, and I'll take that okay. all the way to the spine. Yeah. Um, and the 1 16th, I take it about half the distance up on a two inch wide kitchen knife. Depending on, well, I should say, depending on the steel, um, the knowledge of the user, how they're going to be using it, um, you know, a, a well-trained shaft that is always going to use a soft cutting board and has proper technique, then yeah, I, man, I'll, I'll run that thing up razor thin. Uh, somebody less experienced or somebody that has a heavier handed technique, I might leave the grind a little lower so that the, the edge is a little more robust. So a little stouter so it can handle someone who's who goes at it a little bit harder. Or someone that, you know, so a, a chef that just paid $1,000 for a kitchen knife is not going to nick a bone. When he's breaking something down, he's going to be careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Other people might get a little careless, and if they bang that edge on a bone, I want it to survive. So what steel are we talking about? Um, recently, uh, S35BN has really... I, Settled into that's kind of my sweet spot. Um, I'll take it up between 59 and 60. I really like 60 or a little over Rockwell. Okay. Sorry. Uh -huh. um, and I like, I like the balance between edge retention and toughness. I mean, I've got some S35 VN uh, fillet knives that are at 60 Rockwell, and I can put the tip in a clamp and bend it over 45 degrees Whoa. and let it go, and it'll come back true. And especially with these thin blades, I want it to bend well before it breaks. Yeah. And I want it to, to have lots of bends so you really know something's gone wrong. Um, that same toughness is also what, in my experience, has kept, uh, keeps you from chipping edges out. You, know, you can go with these really thin grinds. And in my experience with S35VN is it doesn't chip out, even though I've got it at 59, 60, 61 Rockwell. Yeah, I remember hearing that that was the whole purpose of S35 um, when they made it uh, was that S30 was great, uh, but in some cases chipped a little bit. So they they yeah. they took out, I guess, a tiny bit of uh, edge retention and replaced it with toughness. I don't know what that looks like chemically, but. And the um, in my experience, S35 VN so outperforms what's been on the market in the kitchen industry that nobody knows that they lost a little bit of edge retention. Uh -huh. um, I mean, most chefs keep a steel in their knife roll and it stays close by on the counter because three, four, eight times a shift, um, they're out there touching up their edges. Uh, and kind of the aha moment for me was I was making a custom for a charcuterie, um, you know, a, a chef that specializes in smoking, preserving meats. And he broke down a hog a week and he wanted a boning knife. And he called me back amazed. He said, I broke down an entire pig and I didn't have to sharpen my boning knife. Oh, said, wow. I've never heard of that before. 
And that was that was the moment that I said, okay, this I've been playing with Magna Cut. I work with some other steels depending on what a customer works wants, but mm -hmm. you know, S35 is just it's delivered for me every time I needed it. So you got to say to the chef, welcome to the world of super steel. <laughs> what, so what are the steels? Uh, I, I worked the line on in, in an Italian kitchen for two summers in a row. So uh, I have six months combined ex professional experience from college days. You and got all had, 10 though, right? Yeah, I do. I do. Uh, almost not at one point, <laughs> but uh, I used to use the one butcher knife that no one ever touched to, to decapitate uh, boxes of salad. Uh, but anyway, my, my, um, my question is, uh, what is the steel that's in those Chicago cutlery, those kind of cheap knives that they bring and, uh, sharpen every week? I, I, tr I truly don't know. It's a simple carbon. I don't know exactly which one it is. I would suspect it's somewhere around 1084, 1080, but I'm not sure. Um, and on one hand, it's inexpensive and you got to sharpen it on, all the time. On the other hand, handle on one side, blade on the other. Um, it takes a decent edge and yeah, you got to touch it up. Um, but it's, you know, it's the VW bug of, of knives. Nobody's proud of it, but it always starts and it'll get you where you want to go, even right. if it's slow and not with much style. Right, right. Yeah. It, and, and and now that it's really, it's the style thing. So what, what you're producing here, and you also make outdoor knives, which I have not experienced, um, but I, I have looked at, um, but, but now you're getting in, in the realm of luxury, what you make are luxury goods. And, and uh, that's, that's what we talk about on this show. Um, these knives that we collect, whether they're high end pocket knives or low end pocket knives, it doesn't matter. Uh, you don't need a $40 pocket knife. In essence, you could have something less and do just fine. So when I'm spending a hundred uh, plus on a knife, that's a luxury. And you embrace that with with your knives here. I mean, this, these are very, very beautiful. I mean, we've talked about how functional they are, but you put these beautifully sculpted handles on with exotic materials. By the way, what is this material? Uh, uh, Jim that, and I were trying to figure that out. That is stabilized wild rice. I knew it. I t <laughs> okay. I knew that. <laughs> I uh, told Jim it's some kind of grain. that's making me hungry. Um, I worked. That's my personal. Uh, it was a prototype. Um, the material is phenomenal, but it didn't have the durability I wanted uh, to go into a, a production. Mm -hmm. um, it was a little finicky to maintain. So for at home and for loners, it was fine, but it wasn't a it wasn't a viable material to to take out to the market. Seems prone to voiding, uh, as the rice might disintegrate internally or something like that. What we learned, um, it was uh, the name of the company was Mental Co. They they've gone out of business. And it started off with like rosemary and thyme leaves, which stabilized really well. And of course, the chefs love the idea of having yeah. a food product as their handle. Um, and then we started with beer hops and that went really well. Uh, we did coffee beans and that was kind of a mixed. Uh, and then we really got crazy and started doing pasta and rice. And what we learned was uh, the really starchy materials as soon as the wet epoxy hit them, they would form a barrier and you just wouldn't get penetration. Oh. So like that handle um, from time to time, I've got to take a dental pick and pick out the little bits of live rice that have gotten exposed and then fill it with uh, CA glue and buff it back out. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I can see where some of that has happened. Um, how cool. What a great idea to make handle scales of stabilized food for chef's knives. That's, that's a really good idea. Uh, when he went out of business, I bought absolutely everything he had and have been, been letting it out a little bit at a time. I've got some stabilized hemp blossoms. I've got a little bit of beer hops left. I've got some coffee beans left. Um, and oddly enough, um, a buddy of mine's a state trooper and he swung by the shop for lunch. And it turns out that Beer hops, when ground, smells exactly like marijuana. <laughs> oh, that's oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. You get one of those skunky IPAs. It's like oh yeah. And I've been grinding all day with my respirator on, and he came in the shop. It's like 
know, what are you doing? <laughs> like, you knew I was coming over here. You can't, you're forcing me. And I was like, well, no, no, it's this, this beer hops handle. He's like, beer hops. Yeah, right. And I had to actually go over to the grinder, stick it on there and hand it to him. And he's like, well, damn. He's like, is that what the kids are calling it these days? Beer hops? <laughs> <laughs> Man. But, well, and chefs, chefs, people that cook are really creative people. I mean, it's just part of what makes you good at it. And the idea of having the choice between black plastic and white plastic as a creative person just really bothered me. I mean, that's physics and physics and metallurgy determines what the blade shape is going to be and what it's made of. But the handle is somewhere where you can play, you can get bright and colorful. You can do, um, I just got, I don't know if you're familiar with it, but there's a restaurant out in California called the French laundry. Sure. Um, I think they're a four Michelin star, but they have their own aprons. They're, they're custom made just for them. The every shift, you throw it in the laundry bin, you come back, you get one. Um, 10 or 12 may have fallen off of a truck when one of my chefs left the laundry. Ah. So we just did a block of Micarta um, with uh, <laughs> GL Hansen of French laundry aprons and chef's coats oh, and a dude. twisted rag Micarta. And that that's where that's where I get to have fun. I get to be creative and find these funky ideas to do with handles. That is brilliant. I, I, it, so it's G Carta, basically. It's GL Hansen yeah. and Sons, G Carta, made uh, of French laundry. So the French laundry, I, I had always heard of it because uh, I had friends in the San Francisco area who were into cooking and that kind of thing. Uh, but then, you know, it blew up when when Governor Gavin Newsom was busted having dinner mm -hmm. there after he told everyone else to stay home. Uh, that is brilliant for those handles. Uh, uh, and, and GL Hansen doesn't do customs. Like they've always said that. And I just called him just, you know, you miss a hundred, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Uh -huh. And he was really patient. He listened to me. He's like, you know what? That's really cool. I'm never doing this again. Don't ask me again, but yeah, I, I got to be a part of this project. <laughs> <laughs> and don't tell anyone that yeah. Do, yeah, that I'll do their project. Yeah, that's good. So what are you going to do? Do you, ha do you have a, an entire project earmarked for that micarta or that G Carta? I don't. I have a handful of chefs that just, um, they said, when it's done, I want it. I Just let me know when it's finished. So a fair amount of it is, is spoken for. Um, and it's... It kind of go. It kind of puts itself in its own market. It's the handle slabs are, are five hundred bucks a set, so that that tends to lend it towards. It's going to be on magna cut. It's going to be on you know a fully hand ground blade that typically is going to somebody that is in a position that they want a Ferrari. Yeah, you know, they they drive fast figuratively, um, and they do it you know six days a week, and they want. You know, they want to push things as far as they can. You know, it also seems uh, the, the whole idea of customizing handles and making interesting handles on chef's knives uh, could be, and, and I'm not just talking on like the $2,000 customs. I just mean on, on, you know, even on production knives, making interesting handles, it could be oh. a useful thing in the kitchen. You know, you got, you got, five guys or guys and girls in a row they're all using yeah. knives they're all working at the speed of uh of the you know meal and uh picking up each other's knives i would i would imagine maybe that doesn't happen too often maybe people are very uh territorial um, about it but you would imagine to have different colored handles would 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 stop any of that uh, people uh chefs especially are extraordinarily territorial about their knives but that does not stop it, Knives get misplaced. All of a sudden you look over and that guy's using your favorite knife. And after, after dinner service, there's going to be words. Um, and then again, it's just the, I mean, this is the tool that you not only feed yourself and your family with, but you feed other people with, I mean, this is without getting too deep. I mean, there's, there is at some degree an emotional bond to this tool. This is something that you use every day and you feed yourself with. And it's not uncommon for people. They want to express themselves a little bit. I mean, this is, this keeps me alive. This feeds me. So, you know, blue's my favorite color or, you know, it, whatever it is, they want, 
they want that tool that supports them and feeds them to reflect them. Um, and that's why on the mid text, I do a lot of options and that's really, you know, the home cook, the line cook that they can't spend a grand on a knife, but they use it and it's a tool and they would appreciate some quality. And that's why I've got the mid text that are in the, the three, $400 range. You know, they're still S35 VN, they're three thirty seconds at the spine, but it's a stone wash finish. Uh, the blades are done in batches of 200. Yeah, I still do the handles by hand, but it's a, it, the same concept. I don't put everything that goes on a custom may not go on a mid tech because the handle can just price it out of the market. But I still at that three, four hundred dollar range, try to to make it special. I mean, uh, how did that happen? Um, how did the mid tech come about? Um, um, a combination of things. One, uh, I was selling full customs vast majority of my market was executive chefs. And at some point I realized a combination of for every one executive chef, there was 15 or 20 line cooks, station cooks, sous chefs that all needed a quality tool. And that that was a market that I, that I wasn't serving. And the other side was talking to, you know, as I got to hang out in the kitchens, starting to talk to some of these guys that they had the skill and the knowledge, uh, yeah, you know, some of these guys are using these blades 60 hours a week. They needed a better quality blade. They needed something lighter. They needed something that cut more efficiently. So the the mid tech was kind of a way to compromise still significantly higher quality than the production knives, but at a price point that was more reasonable for them. Um, and depends. Sometimes you can strip one down and get it into the the high two hundreds, but typically they're three four hundred dollar knives which is still an investment. I mean, that's, that's not nothing, but it was far more achievable than one of my full customs. Oh, sure. People, people spend thousands of dollars on work on tools they need for work, yeah. whether it's a computer or, or a box of uh, hand tools or, or what have you. It seems like uh, 400 bucks, you know, one shift or whatever it happens to be. I, I don't know how, but it, it seems like something uh, you'd read, readily pay. Um, especially because people love knives. Anyway, you, you were afraid you were getting too spiritual over there about, about this being a tool to feed you. But we, we do that all the time here. We, we wax poetic because there is something about knives that is in our genetics, I believe, or our epigenetics, whatever that is. Uh, the, the, you know, the, the genes of the whole, of the whole human race share the love of knives. You pull out a knife and it lights up the room. People like that. Yeah, it was it was the thing that separated us. Well, it's the thing that turned us from prey to predator. Mm. And then as you move forward, it sped up the food processing. It sped up food gathering. And even at a simpler level, it is the first dangerous weapon. Generally speaking, it's the first dangerous weapon you were ever trusted with. My little Barlow pocket knife, would I go to into a street fight with it? But no, but little six-year-old me knew that if the bad guys broke into the house, I, I could cut them with that knife. Like somewhere in the back of your mind, there's always that connection to it's the first dangerous thing you were trusted with. It was your first step towards maturity. I love that. It, it, that's true. That's the first dangerous thing. I'm writing that down. That's beautiful, man. <laughs> it It is. And I'm that's especially resonant to me because uh, my daughter just turned 12. I gave her her first locking knife. She's she has uh, she has a, already a slip joint and she has a Swiss Army knife, but I got her a locking knife and she's been showing it off in pictures. She can't bring it to camp and all that, but she's really proud of it. And and uh, a couple of days ago, there was a short period of time where she was here alone. My wife had to do something. I had to do something. I came back. and She's like, Dad, I had my knife the whole time. <laughs> like right on baby <laughs> like I, I bet that made you feel good but yes the first dangerous thing that we're entrusted with well so tell me your process how do you go about making these uh um the customs and then i'm, I'm also interested in the mid-tech process too but i know that's a whole different <clears throat> ball of wax how do you make these customs so i mean if you want to get philosophical the custom starts with an idea um i was trained that when you go to design a knife the first and most important question you ask is, what is the purpose of this knife? And then anything that aids in that purpose, you add. 
anything that takes away from that purpose, you remove. And anything that's neutral becomes an aesthetic question. So, you know, once I've got the pattern and all of my patterns were tested for at least six months in a commercial kitchen, because in hours, those guys put enough, put days worth of usage into it. You know, if I, if one of those knives spends a month in a kitchen, a commercial kitchen, that that could easily be a year in a household kitchen. Mm -hmm. So any balance issue, any hot spot, um, you know, if, if sharpening is going to wind up thickening the edge too fast, any of those issues show up very quickly in that environment. So it's a really fast way to R and D my blades. <laughs> but once I have my pattern decided, um, once usage or the buyer has determined what the steel and the heat treat is going to be, um, I start with flat bar uh, as close to the finished thickness as possible, just for efficiency. And then like most makers, um, I use die cam layout fluid. I set my pattern. I've got my Carta patterns, set my pattern down and use a scribe, scribe out the line, uh, cut that blade blank to length. And then I go to the grinder. I use a, a tool rest at 90 degrees and typically a 36 grit ceramic belt. Um, typically because of all the particle steel I use, I need a really aggressive and then I will grind the shape out and I can typically keep, excuse me, I'm sorry. I can typically keep about third decimal place accuracy from one pattern to the next doing it that way. Wow. Um, depending on the thickness of the blade and the material, um, I'll grind as much as I can annealed on the bevel drill holes. And then I've got a, a kiln in shop. So I do all my heat treat in shop. Um, so I'll do heat treat temper, come back, put final grind on sand, uh, handle materials. I was a woodworker before I was a knife maker. So I have what we call the wall of handle materials. And I was, I have the cheat of, I have a really, really good cabinet saw left over from my furniture days. So I can mill my handle materials down on the cabinet saw and then it's epoxies and pins and shaping. And I can, when everything is going right and I'm not using magna cut, I can do about three chef's knife in a week or five to seven smaller, either pairing or outdoor knives. Uh, why does magna cut change that? Because it is an absolute, um, it takes easily twice as long to grind. Oh. Um, so typically, even on S35VN, when, after a heat treat, when I go to set the bevels, I'll use an 80 grit belt. And on S35VN, it's about one belt per knife. With Magna Cut, I set the bevels with 36 grit belt, and it is typically three to four belts per kitchen knife. Whoa. Um, a... Uh, I've, I've been very fortunate that Ethan Becker took a, an interest in my career and I had done some thin blades for him, some of the kitchen knives and he, he was visiting after blade show and he didn't call me a liar, but he wasn't a hundred percent that you, that you really had to set the, a bevel on a, a one sixteenth inch blade with 36 grit. Magna cut annealed is great to work with. I mean, works really easily, but once it's hardened, I literally wouldn't use in 36 grit ceramic belts to set the bevels. Okay. Wait, wait. Let me ask you something. Uh, you said before, or I was trying to follow your process. I'm sorry. Not that it's different. No, 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 no. I it just using uh, applying the knowledge I already have. You were talking about grinding and then heat treating and then, and then the finish grinding yep. after that. So is there with a, with a very thin blade steel like this uh, 16th, of an inch um and then you've already ground it down a bit is there worry about it warping in the process so 1 16th doesn't get i don't grind 1 16th at all um as far as the bevel goes mm -hmm. before heat treat um partially because the little bit of steel you could take off before the edge got so thin you'd have to worry about burning the edge out i got you um, so you and, were talking about grinding out the profile. Yeah, the profile oh, okay. I do by hand on a grinder. I'm sorry. Okay. No, no, no. And no. I... A thicker knife, an outdoor knife, or for some reason, like an eighth of an inch, when it's annealed, you know, I might take take the edge off or take put the bevel in until maybe it's 
40, 50 thousandths of an inch thick at the edge, then heat treat and come back and take the rest off. Okay. Uh, but with the thinner materials uh, and also with chef's knives, because typically there's such a high grind on it. If you pre-grind too much material, you really create is issues with your heat treat. Um, you'll get warpage or a lot of the particle steels I use are plate quenched. And if you've already got a grind fairly high and you go to plate quench, you're not getting contact on those bevels and right. you're not pulling the heat off fast enough. Right. So a plate quench is when you pull it out of the kiln, it's in that foil wrapper and you put it between two very, very heavy plates of steel, presumably. I, I've seen that. Yeah. Is that uh, what's I happening? Use, I use um, one inch or two inch aluminum plates and okay. they're set in a vise so that I'll drop it in and then you get positive pressure, which holds it tight, also helps keeping it true and up. And then the, the aluminum plates pull the heat out. All right. All right. So if the bevels are already there, nothing is going to be exactly flat against the other thing and it's going to do what it does. Well, yeah. You'll get an air pocket between the plate and that bevel. So you may not be pulling this heat off fast enough. Um, oh, on heat okay. treat, if you pull the heat off too slowly, you won't get the grain structure that you want. So that air pocket may cause you to not have a, a consistent grain structure throughout the blade and you can get warpage. Okay. All right. I get, hence the term quench. You're not just putting it in there to straighten it or to keep it straight. You're putting it in there to quench it, cool it down as fast as possible. And that's and, also why you're using aluminum, I guess. And traditionally a quench was in a liquid, you know, water, oil. Um, but with some of the modern steels, uh, plate quenching became an option. That's so cool. Uh, so um, you get you get these um, the customs made in in the way that you just described. You don't get them made. You make them. You you cut them out. You grind the profiles. You heat treat them. Um, pull them back out. You make the bevels. You make the handles. Now now tell me the process for mid tech and. I'm presuming that frees you up to do more of these. Um, not, it could, but really what it does is rather than doing three customs in a week, I can do 12 mid techs in a week. Um, okay. So I'm not really doing more customs. And part of the way I can lower the price point of the mid techs is in a week, I can do four times more. And those, uh, I'll use a second party vendor. Uh, they grind to my specs, my heat steel choice. I quality control it. But the, bla uh, the blade blank comes to me as a, a finished product. Um, if it's to my standards and passes my quality control, then I'll put the handles on by hand. I do the shaping. Uh, Andy Roy that I did my, inter my mentorship with or my apprenticeship with was really focused on handles um, mm -hmm. I followed that up with, I was really fortunate that there were a couple of surgeons, a hand surgeon in particular, that I could sit down and, and buy some beers and grill him on, uh, you know, the shape of the hand, um, fatiguing, and all of that goes into those contours in my hand. Yeah. Um, and like those are designed so that if you pinch grip, which most experienced chefs do, you know, it's tapered to the front, but it swells on the back of those fingers so you can get a lock. Yeah. If you you ice pick it or finger over like a lot of home chefs do, that swell, as oh, you move your good. hand back to change that grip, that swell fills the palm of your hand. Uh, the taper on the sides gives you a mechanical lock against the palm of your hand and your fingers. So the, the swell is, is less fatiguing. Uh, it gives you better control with that mechanical lock on your hands. It gives you it gives you very good control and it is also less fatiguing. One of the things I don't like about a lot of the Japanese style handles is you're using a lot of friction to hold that blade. So you're squeezing harder. And that means your hand is more fatiguing. And as your hand gets fatigued, your grip loosens up and you lose control of the blade. Oh, interesting. Yeah. As as opposed to pure ergonomics and shaping. Um I Another person that I worked with was of the opinion that you needed to be able to dip your hand in oil, grab the knife and use it safely. 
that if your contours are right, it's a, a mechanical lock with your hand, not a friction lock. Yeah. And, and even if, you know, you're, even if you've been cleaning fish and you're covered in slime, you still should have complete control of that knife. And that's a, a safety issue, but it's also one of the chefs that I was working with had brutal carpal tunnel. Um, and they thought it was just repetitive stress. And when he started using one of my one sixteenth blades, you know, they're two thirds lighter than the Hinkle he was using. Mm. And it turned out that it was literal from Teague a combination of squeezing that handle so hard and lifting that weight that it wasn't just repetitive stress. It was, it was the weight and the, the fatigue of squeezing so hard that when he went to a, a lighter knife that was easier to control, the, the carpal tunnel got better. So the thinner blade steel and the enhanced or advanced contouring of the handle solved that problem. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and it was just the, the better grind geometry cut easier, so it was less force. The blade right. weighed less. The handle fit his hand better, um, so it was it was less taxing on uh, on his body. So, what was it like working at Fiddleback Forge uh, with Andy Roy? Uh, it was a really intense process. Uh, I learned an enormous amount from Andy. Uh, and I was really fortunate at the time. Dylan Fletcher was also in the shop. So I really got two mentors for the price of one. Wow. And they had very different approaches and very different styles. So it was great to work back and forth between the two of them. And he's got a great reputation for his handles and it's, it's well-deserved. Um, and it was the advantage of not just learning the process from him, but learning the business side, uh, getting some exposure, you know, he helped get me into the market where if I was just Dan Eastland, yeah, I'm, I'm just one of a whole bunch of guys with a grinder. Working with Andy, I got a little bit of a, a leg up that some of Andy's credibility transferred to me. Uh, so it was, it was a phenomenal situation. Um, and he, uh, He'd gotten burned by apprentices a couple of times. Matter of fact, I think he averages nine apprentices for every one that, that graduates. Wow. A lot of people want to be knife makers until it's time to do knife maker stuff. And the first person that I had made a knife with was Mark Hopper, and he is a master blacksmith in three different countries. Phenomenal um, in, in every sense of the word. But he, within a couple of weeks of me starting with him, he moved his shop to downtown Atlanta. I was up in North Georgia. My kids had just started elementary school, but it was going to be a four hour commute and the, mm. the math just didn't work. So I managed to get a hold of the Georgia Custom Knife Makers Guild's um, roster sheet with phone numbers. And that is a phenomenal guild, by the way. Uh, they have produced more knife makers than I think any other more working knife makers. I'm exaggerating. There's probably some national guilds that have done more, but the quality and the volume of skilled knife makers that have come out of that guild is really impressive. But I just started calling guys. Um, and Andy was near my house. I'd called him and he's he just, no, I'm, I'm not taking on apprentices. I don't have time. no. I showed up at guild meetings and was, was just hounding people. Hmm. And now that I've been a maker and I've had a couple of apprentices come through the shop, I understand. I mean, it's time, it's materials. In a lot of ways, you're putting your heart and your soul into this person. You're committing your time. You're sharing really hard earned, earned knowledge. Hmm. And it can be really heartbreaking when they quit. Uh, and I found out that Andy and I had a mutual friend and I just kept working. And finally, Andy's like, all right, enough. You can come to work. I'm not going to pay you. It's August. It's in Georgia. There's no insulation or air conditioning in the shop. And you're going to stand Macarta all day, except for when you're sweeping the floors. And I said, okay. And after about three months of that, three days a week, he sat me down. I was like, okay, if you're not going to leave, I guess I'm going to have to teach you. <laughs> he said, but I need a minimum of 40 hours a week. 
I'm still not going to pay you. Um, and you're going to work on my materials when the work on my stuff is done, then you can work on your own stuff. And that worked out actually. I mean, I was very fortunate to be in a situation where I could work 40 hours a week and not get paid. Mm -hmm. um, but it was in Andy's interest to teach me as much as possible and make me as good as possible because the more that I could do, the more of work I could do on his blades, which increased his productivity, which gave me more experience, which made me better. And it was just a, a growing cycle. And it wasn't long before I could finish all of Andy's work in a couple of hours. And then I could use any tool in the shop as long as I paid for the consumables, you know, the materials, the belts, mm -hmm. the bits. And it was about four or five months before I was making knives that, that I could sell. There's some, some $60, $80 dogwood knives out there that I have desperately been trying to buy back. <laughs> <laughs> is that um, for the dogwood museum or just to get them out of people's hands just out to of get a, it, it, it it makes my skin crawl that something that hideous has got my name on it <laughs> one guy in particular has got one of my very first and every time i see him i'm like brand new knife of vastly mater better materials and skill and 300 bucks and he's like no <laughs> he said uh, you might get really good and then you'll die and this might be worth something one day. <laughs> that's awesome. Uh -huh. You know, that's it. I'm actually wearing the tattoo of someone who is an incredible tattoo artist. But when he did my tattoo, he was heavy handed. And every time I see him, I haven't seen him for years now, but he'd grab my arm, look at it and be like, oh, yeah, oh this is so couple. terrible. And I'm like, I love it. It's an original, you know. <laughs> And plus, don't say you hate it. There's nothing you can do about it. It's on my skin yeah. now. <laughs> you know, you're um, talking about this apprentice system. Uh, I'm sorry if I'm interrupting. Um, I know. You talk about this apprentice system and your personal experience with Andy Roy. And it just strikes me, uh, especially as my as I have uh, children entering or a, a child entering teenage dumb. And then who knows about higher education and and really, who knows about higher education with yeah. everything I read in the news? I'm like, my God, like going into such massive debt for this kind of brainwashing, at least the kind of stuff you hear in the news. I'm not sure if I'm up for that or, or what we're going to do when that time comes. But it just made me think apprenticeship is an age old system and it works. It works for everybody. You became a master knife maker by training under a master knife maker. And you have. OK, I mean. I you have I mastered... appreciate the, I appreciate the compliment, but master knife maker has a very specific. Yes, you're right. You're right. I, I well, what I meant to say is you let you you uh, reached a level of mastery doing that that allowed you to have your own career doing it, yeah. and while you were doing that, you were helping Fiddleback Forge too also push ahead. You know that's a great and and, and time time honored system. And Andy, uh, a lot of people don't know, but Andy was a licensed electrical engineer that got into knife making as a hobby and then the hobby started getting successful enough that he could take a chance on leaving a career that he really wasn't enjoying but i could always tell the day that his student loans were due at the shop because he would be in a foul temper five years five years and hundreds of thousands of dollars do you know how much better a knife maker i would be if i had started this five years sooner mm. uh, yeah. And it's yeah. one of the, I've always told my kids, you're going to get an advanced education. I don't care if it's college or trades, you want to go to tech school and become a master welder. Outstanding. Um, you want to go to college? That's fine. Um, that, you know, you're going to get something useful out of it. But I have, I was a product of that generation where it was, Smart, successful people go to college and losers don't. Mm -hmm. And my generation was really done a disservice. I mean, I've I've got a buddy that's an electrician and another one that's a plumber that make more than the doctor that we hang out with. Um, wow. Yeah. The And part of it is it's not you don't come out with a crippling debt. And part of it is just as arguably more people need plumbers than they need doctors. And it's a, it, it's a skill. Um, so I, I'm sorry, I was about to get on a, a soapbox and a soapbox and a 
rage, but yeah. <laughs> right. um, apprenticeships, uh, tech schools, trade jobs. These are all things that my generation and the one before so, so darkened and put down is, is that's what the, the ignorant do. And now we've got a bunch of people who, yeah, you've, you've got a, you know, a master's in art appreciation, but your toilet's broken and you don't know how to fix it. And you're about to pay somebody six grand to come out. Um, well, that's an exaggeration. You're about to pay somebody $1,300 to come out and change a valve because you got an art appreciation degree that isn't marketable. Yeah. <laughs> Are you talking directly to me? Because you could uh, be. <laughs> well, and it's funny because I, uh, I have interviewed two organizations to be my, my alma mater and neither have, have been up to my standard. Uh, my wife is got a chemist degree from Duke and was going pre-med when she realized pharmaceuticals was going to be a, a great opportunity. So on one end, I've got a senior executive wife, um, works in a very large company and has a, a chemistry degree from Duke. And then you've got me, college dropout, woodworker, knife maker. So the the dynamic in our family is is pretty fascinating. I, I like it. I like it. I think those uh, those kind of um, they're not necessarily opposites, but those kind of contrasts feed each other. Um, uh, somewhat similar in in my relationship as well, you know. And um, it it it, re <laughs> it takes a couple of different uh, uh, charges to make things work. You know, if you're going to have a family, you have to have positive, negative charge, and I don't mean. You know, you know what I mean? I yeah. just mean kind of no, opposing charges. And it, our situation has worked really well because things that I'm deficient at, things that I struggle at are things that Beth is really good at and vice versa. So yeah. we complement each other really well, even though on paper we look extreme opposites. Yeah. Yeah. That's my, for instance, I'm really good at taking out the trash. You know, mm. and and so that's my job. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, I lift heavy things. I, yeah, I right. I can reach stuff real up high. Um, no. Uh, so, all right. I want to know a couple of things before we wrap here. One of them is where do you where do you hope to take the enterprise of Dogwood Custom Knives? Um, we're actually going in a couple of different directions. Uh, I'm we are working on a, uh, a, a full production line. So we're towards the end of the process of under the dogwood umbrella, we'll have full customs, mid techs and production. Um, right now it's all focused on the kitchen. Uh, that's my passion. Uh, I started out in Andy's shop. I started out making outdoor knives. The guys, the outdoor knife community is what let me get started. So I will always make outdoor knives. I mean, that's just, I owe it to the community, but kitchen knives are, that's a, a passion that I'm really focused in one day, you know, pipe dream. I would really like to have to maintain my, my full custom shop as kind of a skunk works R and D um, that then feeds the, the mid tech and the production lines that, that as I invent and perfect a new pattern on the custom side, I can move that into mid tech, see how it does at volume. If it succeeds there, then we move it over to the production side. And I want to get quality knives in as many hands as I can. And quality can be a Ferrari $1,200 full custom knife. It could be you saved up a week's pay for a mid tech that is still really high performance or it could be you're just getting started and it's, you know, a $60 production knife. Uh, all I want to maintain that high standard um, handles are obviously really important to me on the, on the production side, we're looking at multicolor materials, you know, multi-layer G10, micartas, Stuff that is cost effective to machine and produce, but it's got some style, you know, a, a highly polished uh, canvas micarta that's got some some texture to it or, oh, yeah. 
you know, a, a black and red uh, G10 because, you know, the contours I put in my hand, it gives you that kind of topo feel to it. And you can put some G10 handles and uh, pins in there and give it a little pop. Um, so there's there's still a lot of room to to be expressive, to be something other. You shouldn't have to hide your kitchen knives. Like <laughs> They should be attractive. You should be able to put them on the magnetic rack right out in the middle of the kitchen. Absolutely. And, and, and it, and seeing how the pocket knife world has, has exploded, not like it's done so recently, it just continues to, it's like the big bang. It's just continuing to expand in a glorious way. Um, and yet people use their pocket knives probably relatively less. So I, than a kitchen knife. So I think that this is a, an idea whose time is long overdue, actually, uh, bringing, bringing knives with character uh, to 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 the production realm, to the mid-tech realm, but definitely to the production realm that goes beyond uh, the kind of cheesy stuff you get, like the forged in fire package deals. And uh, like, yeah, those have color on them, but they're they're crap. Um, you know, to I, I think to get really classy, nice knives in the hands of people is the way to go. One of the things that has really helped the kitchen industry, um, from my perspective, one, a lot of the big companies just didn't, for whatever reason, they just haven't innovated. They haven't upgraded. They just churned out the same old thing, which was a great opportunity for me. But with the, the explosion of the bushcraft community and the pocket knife community, people started to learn what makes a really quality knife. You know, your, your geometry, your balance, your materials. And that education carries over. At some point, somebody realizes, for the same reason I bought a $400 bushcraft knife that I use two days out of the month, all of those same reasons apply to the kitchen knife that I use every day. So we're as people are getting better educated, people are starting to realize, hey, I don't have to use, I don't have to use a piece of crap. Like I can get a good knife that is safer. It's easier to use. And when you have a good tool, chores are less of a chore. Yeah. Mm. yeah. The experience is nice. It's nice cutting with a nice knife, with a good and knife. One of the great things about the particle steels is, so S35 at about 60 Rockwell, in a commercial kitchen, um, the chefs I was working with, they'll strop their knife on Wednesday and sharpen it on, on Saturday, which when they were using their hinkles and stuff, they kept their steel at their workstation. They were touching it up several times a night and having to sharpen every other day. Mm. And that carries over to, you know, if you get a week's worth in an industrial kitchen, you're talking about months in a home kitchen. Yeah. And once a knife takes and keeps an edge, you know, again, a, a good tool makes a job easier. And, I have found that when the knife keeps the edge, people, that's one of those aha moments of, okay, this is why it's worth to pay a couple of hundred bucks rather than 60 at Walmart. Exactly. All right. So I saw, um, I saw your definition of success as a knife maker and, <laughs> and it, and it, it occurred to me as this is, this could probably fit across the board. You, what is it? Um, <laughs> Sorry. Um, if some, if a grandfather hands their ki grandkid one of my knives and says, I got this when I was your age, that's, that's success to me. Absolutely. That's, that's how I got my first knife. And that's how so many people I've talked to here on this show have gotten their first knife. And, and I think that that's a beautiful notion. Um, creating something that outlives yourself and, and kind of goes on to do, to do great things in your, you know, in, in the beyond, because it's feeding people. Now it's going to feed people in the future. And a quality tool should be generational. Um, yeah. Just like your grandfather's old woodworking tools, something that is sh tools should be built to quality and that quality should last generations. Amen. Dan, thank you so much for coming on the Knife Junkie Podcast, sir. It's been a great pleasure. Thank you very much. I was flattered. Oh, man, it's a pleasure. I'll talk to you real soon. Looking forward to it. All right, take care. Ever strop a knife again? 
even though it gets no real use? Face up to what you are. You're a knife junkie. There he goes, Dan Eastland of Dogwood Custom Knives. I just love the idea of a this three-tier uh, idea, uh, custom, mid-tech, and then production. We don't hear about that in this realm of kitchen knives, and we're hearing about it now, and I think it's an it's a great idea. I'm on board. Like I said before, I think I need to up my game in the kitchen. Not only have I been lazy on the cooking front, uh, but maybe I just haven't been inspired uh, knife-wise in the kitchen. So maybe that will turn everything around. All right. Well, thank you for watching. Be sure to join us next Sunday for another conversation with another interesting Knife World individual. And then, of course, join us on Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental Thursday night is Thursday Night Knives uh, at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here live on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Mm -hmm.